was harder than we anticipated, and it was much, much colder. We're a team of six people. Our goal is to determine what the highest peak in Burma is and then climb it. I'd like to solve this fantastic geographical mystery. Not warm. It never let up, just taken down to like nothing. And how, how does that happen? I first learned of Hakakaba Razi in 2001. That's the name of the peak. And so for you know, 15 years, I've dreamt of going to this place in northern Myanmar, the eastern edge of the Himalayas, and exploring this mountain. And finally, in the fall of 2014, uh, this sort of imagined expedition came to pass. This is us down to nothing at the end of our trip one of the most incredible, incredible adventures I've ever been on in my life. And that's saying a lot. I've been on probably 40 different expeditions all over the world. In 2011, I led an expedition of about 12 athletes with North Face. Conrad Anker was one of those. And it was a really amazing success. We all summited, skied from the top, and um, that led to an invite to go on a National Geographic North Face supported expedition to Everest. Mark Jenkins just happened to be on the trip as well. I'd never met him before. He was coming in late. We spent 10, 10 days hiking into base camp together. And that was where we started talking about all these adventures and exploration that we'd done. And, and Mark is incredibly well-traveled. And the story of Burma came up. And I didn't know the Himalayas ended in Burma. So we started talking about Hakakabo Razi, and Mark had actually tried to go and climb it when the area was closed and been like arrested and all these crazy things that Mark does. As we got further into the climb of Everest, and you can see here, this is heading towards the summit and the people and the crowding. And it was just a stretch from where I had started as this adventurer and new places. And here was this amazing mountain, but a lot of people and just a different way of climbing that I wasn't used to. Mark and I summited uh, Everest together, and when we came down, as we were walking out, we were like, this is happening. We're gonna make Hakakabo Razi happen, and that's gonna be our next trip, and it's gonna be anti-Everest, and it's gonna be an adventure. <laughs> Little did we know. <laughs> so the idea behind it was to really explore and travel overland and find this mountain and take GPSs with us and tag the summit and see if it really was the highest mountain in Southeast Asia. So planning the trip, this is pretty much what I had to work with. And you can see that the whole mountain is blurred out, like it doesn't really exist. Then the next thing is, you know, you have to pick a team. So this had to be a really unique team because we were going for two months and there's probably only like 10 days of actual climbing. So first of all, getting a bunch of athletes together is like herding cats. They're all over the world all the time. And then we show up, you know, in Tokyo with a zillion bags. They all weighed about 70 pounds. And we're used to Nepal standards of you carry everything. You have jeans at base camp and you have extra shoes and flip-flops and a sun hat, and um, we showed up with all of that stuff. It didn't last very long. Um, quick video about us getting into the country. Usually on these trips, you definitely don't take time to see a place so much, which is definitely a drawback to a lot of expeditions, is you, you land in this foreign place, but you just beeline it straight for the mountains. of this as kind of the anti-Everest trip. We'd, we were coming off of Everest together, been successful, and kind of wondered, okay, what's an old-fashioned expedition? Start in the capital of the country, go overland all the way to your mountain. With this team, I think we have as good a chance as anyone of resolving the mystery of what's the highest peaks in Burma.
normally as a climber, you just, you, you fly through these countries and you go straight to the mountains. And it's actually a risk to travel over land because that's the time when you get sick, uh, you wear yourself down unnecessarily. But none of us had been to this country and all of us individually had spent so much time in Asia in general that we wanted to really experience the country. And that involved going overland, which was about a thousand miles. And we took about every possible mode of transportation you could imagine. So I have this like romantic notion of trains that is, um, I think it doesn't apply to this country. <laughs> This was a gentleman that I, we thought was actually dead when they were putting him in there, but he wasn't. He was alive and he was kind of being passed through this window to his family inside. This is as the train started and I think from that expression on my face, this was early on. And I was still thinking like, oh my gosh, this is so great. Like, wow, this is gonna be amazing. And then um, there's a, another video here that'll give you a better idea of what the train was like. I would say this is definitely another step above the Everest trip. More remote, more challenging. And the worst travel experience I've ever had. <laughs> Literally, you'd be airborne and then just slam back into your seat and then you'd be launched again and then slam back into your seat. Doing that for 18 hours just sort of makes you insane. We're on an adventure and I think that was what got me started in expeditions in the first place. Just this excitement for the unknown. I mean, the funny thing about an adventure is that you never know when the unknown part is going to strike you. And we learned later, Taylor, who was the base camp manager, she was like, so before we left, I was kind of looking on the internet and I found this thing that the train in Burma is called the death train. I was like, why didn't you tell us that before we got on the train? Um, but yeah, so that's... Don't ride the train in Burma. So the train took us to Machina. We are now in the Kachin state and there is a little bit of uh, tribal fighting and everything between Machina and Putao. So we were required to take a domestic flight to Putao, which was kind of our final de destination before we set out for the mountain. So Putao, 205 miles to the mountain. We just had our own feet to get us there and motorcycles. At this point, we were put under town arrest in Putao. And we arrived on a Friday. We were supposed to leave on Saturday. We had our motorcycles ready. We had porters waiting for us in the jungle. And we couldn't leave town. And Mark and I were frantic. We were running around trying to talk to every government official, every, anyone we could. But, of course, it was the weekend, and it was like some random weird holiday, and nobody would talk to us. And finally, Monday afternoon, after we went through government in Yangon, we finally got clearance. But we didn't actually, we weren't actually able to leave until Tuesday. In the end, this four-day delay caused a lot of strife as the trip went on. So the day that we were cleared to go, it started raining, of course. And a lot of the motorcycle drivers had left. So we ended up having to confine a lot of our gear on a, on a smaller amount of bikes. This was Taylor. She was on the back of uh, this guy's bike. And um, I just like this picture. She was kind of miserable. Um, and you'll see why here from this next video. We finally got our permissions yesterday. We are packing up motorcycles and it looks totally sketchy. So my driver, he just cracked a beer at 7.30. I'm gonna ride with him. <laughs> got a 50 pound backpack and a 30 pound Moby in my right hand. Not really sure how that's gonna work. But let's see how it goes. I mean, I don't know, it's probably really hard driving, but I just feel like I'm the shittiest driver. We're in uh, Expedition 101 mode. And it's definitely partly, you know, my mistake. 
I should have been uh, keeping better track of where the bikes were and everything, but right now we're getting pretty spread out. On the way in, we did 80 miles in motorcycles in four days. And then we started the jungle walk. When we were first getting on the motorcycles, one of this driver, one of, one of the drivers looked at me and I, I was wearing shorts. And he was like, shorts? It's like pants, you should put on pants. I was like, oh no, 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 I'm fine, it's super hot. I don't like heat. Um, so I went out the first day in shorts. I thought he meant cause like you could get scratched by bamboo or you know, whatever. But instead I just got completely mauled by these noceums. So there weren't mosquitoes, but there were these gnats and bees, all these bee stings. And I'm, I had hundreds of bites just from that one day. And I, I put shorts on even that, or pants, like I had the, you know, those trekker zip on things. And I, I, I mean, I put pants on by the end of the day because I kind of finally figured it out, but it was already too late. And um, so this, this was my first real test with suffering. I mean, I live at 9,000 feet for a reason because I don't really like bugs. I think, does anybody ever feel like this like if you have an intense dislike of something then it seems to recur over and over in your life <laughs> mine's like bugs and snakes and spiders and I must have come across five different snakes on the trek and this was the first one that I almost stepped on within like two hours of getting off the motorcycles and walking on the trail there's a lot of snakes in Burma some leeches, lots of leeches in the area. These actually be, were so common and frequent that they kind of became inconsequential by the end. But the first time we were hiking at night through the jungle and just coming down and Emily got there before me and she sat down and I had this white shirt on and she had her headlamp on and I took my pack off and I undid the buckle and she looks up with her headlamp and the entire middle section of my white shirt was soaked in blood and she screamed and started freaking out and it was from a leech like I had no idea I never even saw it and just when they fall off they they put this sort of anticoagulant in you and so you, you continue to bleed so it didn't hurt me or anything but it looked so gruesome <laughs> I thought Emily was gonna faint but the one thing that stood out was the water and I think this is the reason none of us got sick was because it was the clearest bluest best tasting water I have ever seen in my entire life. And I think it's just because this area is so untrammeled. You had springs coming out of the side of the hills that we, you know, we had all these water pumps and everything that we just stopped using and just drank the water straight. And it was incredible and none of us got sick. So going back to that town of rest, the porters didn't wait for us for those four days. They left. We didn't realize we were coming right at harvest season. So they all went back to the fields. And so this was a major issue. And we had enough gear for 80 porters, but there's not this porter history like there is in Nepal or India or Pakistan. And so none of them really cared. They thought we were just crazy people trying to get into a mountain with a way too much stuff. So at any given point, the most we had was maybe 30 porters. And what happened was we had to make some really tough decisions at this point, and that was hang on to those base camp booties and go home or cut a lot of our gear. We basically cut about two-thirds of our gear. At one point, Renan, who's like this big man's man, was like in tears because he had to get rid of all of his camera stuff. Uh, I mean, the most incredible uh, takeaway from this is what Corey and Renan were able to pull out as far as uh, video and photography with literally sharing lenses and two camera bodies and nothing else. Mm -hmm. 